Good morning all. This immediate judgment application hearing is in the matter of CFI 066-2023 and is being held by way of video conference before Justice Rene Lemire with the sitting of the hearing taking place in Dubai. Any orders or directions made during the course or after this hearing will be issued by the registry in Dubai on the judge's instructions. The claimant is represented by Charles Russell Speechley's lead counsel is Mr. Glenn Bull. The defendant is represented on a pro bono basis by Mr. Arvin Lee of We Suito. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Now, Mr. Lee, uh, you seek to rely upon the fifth wit witness statement of Ms. Kakari. Um, so I'll first of all ask Mr. Bull if you object to that being relied upon. I know, Your Honour. No, right. I'd, I'd be okay. Yes, thank um, you, Mr. Bull. I, I would note that that witness statement was amended by a sixth yes. witness statement served the following day. Yep. Yes, yes. All right, well, thank you. Well, Mr. Bull, perhaps you'd like to make your submissions. Thank you, Your Honour. Your Honour, I trust you've had time to review the materials on the bundle, particularly the skeleton arguments. Yes. Um, Your Honour, I'll first note, while we filed this application on the 6th of June, 2024, um, this was just three days after the defendant had filed her witness statement in this case. And when that evidence was filed, the defendant was represented by Habiba Muller and Partners, who were formerly known in Dubai as Baker and McKenzie. The defendant did this, uh, sorry, the claimant took this action because the defendant's evidence was deemed so acutely deficient, it was obvious on its face that this matter could not proceed uh, to the trial that was scheduled to commence on the 12th of September 2024. It was plainly obvious that the defendant would lose this case and it seemed incumbent on us to try and conclude it promptly and without either party incurring the cost of the trial. Over the course of the next three months, we dealt with an application by the defendant to delay the hearing of this application, received one witness statement in response to that application that was filed about two months late. And I note that such was even filed uh, and served beyond the date permitted by Your Honour's orders of the 7th of August, 2024. And of course, we received the defendant's skeleton arguments. Then over the last two days, we've received the two witness statements that we've just referred to. Uh, we've received new documents uh, exhibited in those witness statements that were not provided during the standard disclosure proceedings, um, uh, standard disclosure phase, which I know expired about six months ago. We then received the witness statement amending the, the first witness statement, and yesterday we received purported arguments uh, from the defendant's counsel that they now intend to make uh, along with some cases. As such, Your Honour, despite this application taking an inordinate amount of time to come before this court, I regret to note that there has been somewhat of a shambolic last couple of days. And for that reason, I feel that we're not fully prepared to address all of the points that my learned friend may now want to raise. However, despite all of this and the submissions and arguments now being raised, I would submit to the court that nothing has materially changed and that the claimant skeleton arguments reveal the fundamental strength of its claim and the acute deficiencies of the defendant's defence, and to an even greater extent, the deficiencies of the defendant's counterclaim. I don't intend to use this time today to repeat the content of my skeleton arguments, well, but I'll provide a summary of the on, dispute. Before you go any further, Mr. Bull, uh, you said at one time something to the effect that you've not had uh, a full opportunity to consider all of the matters that have been put forward by the defendant. Do you, however, wish to proceed with this application now? Yes, you Your Honour. You don't seek to adjourn to put on any further material or answers? No, no, Your Honour. I, I, th there is an email received yesterday uh, which mm. purported to raise an argument about the legality of uh, a provision relating to the interest. I don't yes. know the basis of that argument. I haven't prepared a response to that, to that argument. But at the right. same time, I'm quite confident that there's nothing really to say to that argument. But we'll, I will wait to see what Mr. All Lee right. has to say. All right. Thank you. The parties entered into a binding agreement in March of 2018 mm -hmm. when they executed a lease for the premises within the Index Mall. For your general understanding, the Index Mall is a small retail mall owned by the claimant 
uh, as you'll note from the witness statement of Ross McLaughlin, pages 193 and 194 of the bundle, it has about 20 retail tenants. The mall connects to a larger mall called the Gate Mall, which is a cornerstone of the DAFC district. This document is referred to in the particulars of claim and skeleton arguments as the initial lease. After delays in relation to the construction of the mall, the premises were handed over to the defendant on the 22nd of November 2018, and permits allowing the defendant to commence a fit out were granted on the 9th of December 2018. In relation to that permit, I refer the court to page 113 of the bundle, where the court will see that the defendant's fit out contractor, SFX Interior, had applied in that document to commence a fit out works on the 16th of December 2018 and held out to the claimant that it would complete the works by the 6th of May 2019. It was no secret that at this time the delay suffered by the claimant in being able to hand over the premises had meant that the rent free period due under the initial lease had expired. As such, the parties renegotiated the lease. On the 3rd of February 2019, the parties signed a new lease. When they did this, both parties impliedly renounced the initial lease and simultaneously entered into the new lease. Now, when you say, Mr. Bull, when you say the parties renounced the lease, was that done expressly or do you say? Impliedly, Your Honour. It's implied, all right. Yes. Implied and by entering into the new lease. Exactly. And I, I refer to a case uh, from Scotland where that exact scenario had occurred. Uh, in my skeleton arguments. Well, I'm not sure that case helps me much, okay. Mr. Bull, because the paragraph you drew my attention to, if I recall, uh, it was a case on appeal, and in effect, the appellate court said, as I recall it, that the trial court had found, as a matter of fact, that the entering into of the second lease amounted to a renunciation of the first one. I, I, I um, didn't understand it to be saying that as a matter of law, entering into uh, a second lease necessarily renounced the first one. It, my recollection, and I, I read it fairly uh, superficially, uh, mm -hmm. was that they simply recited that that was a finding of fact by the lower court. Okay, now I understood. Um, I, I would submit that uh, upon signing a, a lease for the new prem for the same premises uh, with new dates, new check dates, new uh, term of the lease uh, could only fundamentally operate to to renounce the first one and put into effect the new one. Um, does that, and you use the word renounce, and I, I know that was the word that was used in the Scottish case mm -hmm. you referred to, but do you intend in using that word to uh, be saying that the renunciation, to use your word, uh, included or involved a discharge of any accrued liabilities at that time, as distinct yes. from merely having given up uh, any um, ongoing rights under the previous lease? Yes, um, the first lease provided, uh, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of the, of the procedures with leasing in, in the UAE, but it is still a case where checks uh, rule the payment process. And in fact, those checks are provided uh, at the beginning, post dated, and then encashed right. as as they fall due. And right. so the defendant had provided all of the checks due under the 2018 lease, and had received right. and had made some payments, including the marketing fee that was due under both leases. Um, but that marketing fee was then not re uh, billed under the second lease. The marketing fee was was transferred across. The checks right. that had been provided were all returned and exchanged for new checks. And um, and the funds that were payable to the fit out contractor that had been affected under the first lease, but were all treated as being paid under the second lease. 
Right. So, so the first lease was essentially treated by all parties as having never been in effect, and the new lease came in and and accounted for and dealt with all of those points. So yes. funds paid uh, earlier were treated as being paid under the second lease. Yes. Now on the 3rd of February, the party signed the new lease. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll, the term of the new lease was 1 January to 31 January, uh, 1 January 2019 and ran to 31 January 2024. Notwithstanding the fact that the, the defendant had given the premises uh, to the defendant on the 22nd of November and her contractors had specified in their work permit application that they would start the fit out on the 16th of December and complete the works by the 6th of May, the defendant had it until the 1st of August to complete a fit out and the period up to the 1st of August was rent free. As such, on 3 February 2019, when the parties executed the new lease and that document came into effect, the defendant was in possession of the premises. The defendant's fit-out contractor had agreed to the fit-out of the whole of the premises for a sum of 1.8 million dirhams. The claimant had approved some two months beforehand the carrying out of those fit-out works. The defendant's fit-out contractor had received from the claimant a sum of 756,000 dirhams towards the cost of those fit-out works. How much? 756,000. Right. The defendant had submitted to the claimant a payment plan pursuant to which she confirmed to the claimant that she was responsible for the payment of the next 750,000 dirhams towards her fit-out contractor for the fit-out works. Most importantly, Your Honour, on the 3rd of February, when the defendant signed that lease and delivered it to the claimant as this, she made a binding commitment to the claimant. The defendant's commitment to the claimant was not only to affect the fit out of the premises, which is a significant cost, nor was it just the financial commitment of paying the rent and service charges, which totals in excess of 5 million dirhams, but also she committed to start a business from scratch and after completion of the fit out works, operate the business from the premises for the next four and a half years. On the 3rd of, 3rd of February 2019, the defendant made an enormous financial decision. She took a calculated risk and she went for it. However, of those commitments that she made, none of them were fulfilled. If I may refer the court to pages 161 and 162 of the bundle. Your Honour, these photos were taken in July of 2019. At the time, six months into a seventh month fit out period, what you see in these images is the extent of the works that were carried out. In light of those images before you, the claimant had contributed more than 750,000 dirhams towards these works, which equates to about 300,000 Australian dollars. When we look at those images, we do not see any meaningful progress towards a fit out of a beauty salon. It's the evidence of George Frank, after these photographs were taken, no further works were ever affected to the premises by the defendant or her contractors. What was achieved on site over that period from 16 December 2018 to the time that the claimant terminated the lease and retook possession of the premises was that, a complete and abject failure. The defendant blames the claimant for this. As addressed point by point in the skeleton arguments, that blame is misconceived and baseless. For example, the defendant says that the drainage was an issue and the reason why the works couldn't be carried out. However, as the court can see at page 122 of the bundle, there is an email from the defendant's contractor dated 4 February 2019, in which it responds to the drainage issue and states, has been sorted. The defendant says the claimant didn't pay her contractor as it agreed to. Your Honour, the allegation is absolutely false. If I may refer the court to page 336 of the bundle, you will see that the defendant herself sent an email on the 3rd of February 2019, the date that she signed the lease, stating explicitly that she would pay the fit out contractor the next 750,000 dirhams that fall due before any further sum was payable by the claimant. The defendant says the claimant didn't deal with her in good faith. 
Your Honour, the claimant only first put their foot down in this matter on the 27th of October 2019. At this point, the defendant had defaulted in the payment of 195,000 dirhams in rent. The works, which were planned to have been completed by May 2019 and were due under the lease to have been completed by August 2019, were at the level we just looked at in those photographs taken in July. And even then, the moment the claimant's group head of real estate portfolio stepped in to withhold a further extension of the fit out permit, he stated that the withholding of this permit was pending full payment of all dues and reasonable assurance that the defendant was in a position to honour the terms of the lease. Your Honour, what more could the defendant expect? How much more lenient, cooperative and understanding could a landlord be in this situation? Why this project was a disaster is unclear. I submit to Your Honour that the claimant has presented detailed evidence to the court to show that it was not in any way the claimant's fault. Putting the defendant's baseless allegations to the side, the defendant has perhaps disclosed the real reason for what unfolded, simply that she overcommitted herself and didn't have the money for this project. At paragraph six and seven of her witness statement, dated 23 August, the recent one, she notes that in 2017, she went out and pursued another business venture. In these paragraphs, she confirms that in June 2017, predating the initial lease and the lease, the defendant went out and leased another premises, fitted out, fitted it out, and started a new business from scratch. In other words, Your Honor, shortly before entering into the initial lease, and then the lease, the defendant made a huge financial undertaking with regards to another venture. At this time, the claimant and the defendant were only parties to a non-binding offer to lease. The defendant's decision to proceed with starting two businesses within a period of 12 months of each other was a decision that she made of her own will and risk. At paragraph 14 of the defendant's witness statement, dated 23 August, the defendant stated as follows. I was getting too much pressure from the claimant's side, the claimant's management company, as I was clear to them that I needed financial support and I was stressed to make the payments to the contractor without their support. The defendant then stated at paragraph 16, in August 2019, the check against the rent was bounced due to insufficient funds. However, the service charges for the whole of the year 2019 were paid in full. I requested the claimant to wait and hold the payment as I was trying to complete the fit out works as soon as possible without gaining any financial support and that I was financially stressed. Your Honour, whilst what is stated there is deeply unfortunate, we must note that paragraph 16 of the defendant's evidence was filed to oppose this application. This, Your Honour, was included as her best evidence that she has a prospect of succeeding in this case. Instead, I would submit with the greatest of respect that these statements are absolute proof that she has no prospect of success in this case. Firstly, the defendant admits here to a material breach of the lease. The check provided for rent had bounced and she never paid the sum that was due. Pursuant to clause 10.1e of the lease, uh, page 370 of the bundle, the landlord at any time shall have the right to terminate the lease if any check issued by the tenant for any amount is dishonoured and or returned by the bank. And clause 10.1a also provides that the landlord can terminate the lease if any part of the rent is unpaid for a period of 30 days after notice is served. Both terms had been breached. She has said that she was trying to finish the fit out works as soon as possible. I referred your honour to the photos of July and the extent of the works that were achieved. It is not like we were at the point of waiting for final finishes or inspections. When the check bounced, the works had barely begun. This is seven months since the fit out contractor was permitted to start works and three months after her contractor had expected to finish these works. She has said that she needed financial support to complete the works. Your Honour, the claimant had has had paid to the contractor a sum of 756,000 dirhams towards those works. It's implausible that the works done on site cost more than 756,000 dirhams. Something doesn't add up. And in fact, it didn't. 
This brings me to another point, Your Honour. More than two months before the works on site had begun, the claimant had paid the sum to the defendant's fit-out contractor. The contractor then revealed on the 30th of December 2018 that he had been instructed to pay 230,000 dirhams of that money to the account of the defendant's JBR business. A copy of that letter is at page 323 of the bundle. The JBR business, Your Honour, sorry, is my reference to her second business in JBR, uh, Jamira Beach Road, I think, <laughs> uh, but just known colloquially as JBR. The JBR business then purportedly sent 225,000 dirhams of that money, uh, uh, spent 225,000 dirhams of that money on salon furniture from Nizza Equipment. But Your Honour, no furniture was ever delivered to the site. There's no evidence, in fact, that such amount was ever paid to Nizza Equipment. Whilst the defendant has produced a copy of a cheque payable to Nizza Equipment, there's no evidence that such cheque was ever sent or cashed. This conduct occurred behind the back of the claimant, and despite all of this coming to light uh, in the witness statement of Ross McLaughlin, the defendant maintains in a witness statement dated 23 of August, at paragraphs 21 and 22, that she was prevented from performing her obligations because the claimant failed to make the payments of the full amounts which was promised and agreed to be paid towards the fit-out works. The fact that this argument still comes up now in August of 2024, after the, this fact has been exhibited and disclosed in the emails is too much. The defendant's arguments here are not based in logic, law or fact. Your Honour, I noted at paragraph 16 that the defendant's witness statement was telling, but of course it is sad. I submit to the court that it cannot be distracted by this. As just noted, she arranged for the claimant, uh, she arranged behind the claimant's back to transfer 230,000 dirhams to the account of her other business. The defendant has testified that she's, she studied business administration and was an experienced business development executive before she undertook this venture. At paragraph seven of her witness statement, she has stated as follows. Given that I've worked in business develop as a business development executive and was always interested in finding market needs and catering to them, my decision to open a salon was a perfect mixture between my personal and professional interests. She was not naive and she was not forced to by the claimant to enter into this lease. She chased the claimant. She persisted with leasing the premises from the claimant after it suffered almost two years of delay and disruptions to the construction of the mall. At any time, she could have walked away, especially after she started the JBR business. Under the offer to lease, she had every right and opportunity to not proceed with entering into the lease in 2018, turning her focus to the resources, focus and resources to her JBR business. But she didn't. In 2018, she proceeded to enter into the lease making a commitment of several million dirhams to the claimant. And while she did not seek any legal advice in this process, she did hold out and engaged in detailed negotiations in relation to the term of the new lease. This resulted in the term being extended from five years to five years and one month. She knew what was she was doing and she proceeded to make a binding commitment to the claimant. Your Honour, the courage and fight of the defendant is admirable. She has displayed an unyielding persistence to not give up on the project, submitting in a lawyer's letter in November 2019 that the works could be completed if she was just given another two months. This was sent in the face of unpaid rent now totaling in excess of 324,000 dirhams. The defendant maintained an unbelievable level of optimism that this project could still be come through for her. Instead of seeking to negotiate a way out in July, when the writing was on the wall, she fought back. Again in November 2019, when the matter was utterly hopeless, she refused to back down. The exact same thing is happening now in this case. She has no prospect of success in this case, and despite this, she refuses to back down. Permitting this case to continue will only enable her to continue the hopeless fight. She has asked for additional time. She asked for additional time to find new counsel to support her in this case, 
and it took more than two months to find one. A council appointed now only several days ago has intimated that it is their intention to amend her already amended defence and amend her counterclaim and drag this matter out for who knows how much longer. As stated at the beginning, we have not had time to consider the points put forward by our learned counsel, uh, the defendant, uh, in detail, but in the, any event, we'll try and address uh, or note some of the following matters. The paragraph eight of the defendant skeleton arguments, page 737 of the bundle, the defendant has raised a question as to when the lease was terminated. I do agree that there is a question as to when the lease uh, was terminated. In our particulars of claim, at paragraph 46A, we sought relief for unpaid rent. At paragraph 46B, we sought relief for the difference between the rent paid by the tenant and the rent paid by the replacement tenant. At paragraph 41 of our particulars, we detailed this claim concerning the difference of the rent paid and the rent that was payable by the defendant under the lease by reference to clause 10.3G of the lease. This term provides that the lease has if the lease has been terminated, the landlord may claim damages for any difference in the total rent due under the lease, total rent being defined as rent and service charges due under the lease, and the total rent amount due under any new lease entered into by the landlord in relation to the premises. As such, we are claiming rent up to termination and damages in the form of unpaid rent and unpaid service charges for the remainder of the term. So could you tell me which clause was that that you're referring to? 10.3G. 10.3G. G. Yes, I see. Should the court find, and it now seems the case, uh, based on what occurred from the uh, and what has been uh, revealed by the defendant, that termination occurred sometime in late 2019 or early 2020, the sum referred to in 46A of the particulars of claim will decrease. However, the dates in 46B will change and the sum payable pursuant to 10.3G, uh, which we're claiming at 46B of the particulars of claim, will increase by the corresponding amount. As such, whilst I agree there is a question over when the lease was terminated, the point should have no bearing whatsoever on the quantum of the damages due. Well, well let me see if I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Up until the time the lease terminated, the, your client, the landlord, was entitled to receive and recover from the defendant the rent due under the lease. Correct. Right. Upon the lease terminating, terminating, the tenant no longer had an obligation to pay the rent under the lease. Is that right? Correct, yes. Your client, the, the landlord, then had a right to bargain damages. That Those damages... Uh, Ordinarily, and it would seem confirmed by the terms of the agreement, would be an amount equal to the difference between the rent under the terminated lease and any new lease entered into by the landlord. But Agreed. Does the landlord not have an obligation to mitigate? its loss yes it, it does your honor and and that's something that we will address uh in a, in a, a short moment well that doesn't that mean the date on which the um, lease is terminated is relevant because from that moment from the date on which the lease is terminated the landlord is under an obligation to mitigate its loss. And that okay. would be yeah. to yeah. take steps to obtain a new tenant. Correct. So, for example, I think you've probably got the point, but 
yep. what they're making is that the landlord sits on his hands uh, for another two years. He can't say, well, look, it doesn't matter when I terminate it because the rent under the lease is the same as the difference between the rent under the lease and what I got from leasing it because I didn't lease it. Yeah. But he wouldn't be able to do that because he would then be in breach of his duty to, to mitigate. I agree with what you've said. and and um, But to that point, uh, the position is that the landlord did do everything they could to rent this premises. Uh, as you see from the evidence of Ross McLaughlin, no uh, other unit in the mall was able to be can led. Can you take me to the evidence? Uh, for sure. Um, it's uh, document C3 and the page. Pages 193 of the bundle. So here we have a table of all of the current tenants and the lease start yes. date. And uh, this premises is RT 211, 212, 213. Uh, yes. This was leased out on the 21st, on the 12th of December, 2021. Right. But there is no other unit uh, since the Platform 3 fitness leases were entered into in October of 2019, no unit was leased after that date and no unit was leased in 2020 and no unit was then leased until these premises on the 12th of December 2021. The, the mall at the, at the beginning was small. It had only a few tenants and it, it wasn't, didn't have traffic. It wasn't at the time connected to the gate mall, which is a thoroughfare of retail shops in the DIFC. Um, it, that was still at the, at the beginning of, the, of, of its inception. And as a, as a person who walks through this building on a nightly basis, I saw the progress as the tenants started to come. But it was only in 2021, 22, when tenants started to come back. It's now quite full, but there's still some vacant spots, uh, as you can see. These units have still never been leased. Yeah. But so far, the only evidence you've pointed me to is that uh, there was no unit in the mall that was leased after yeah. the termination of the lease uh, until 12 December 2021. Correct. This, this, this landlord is... How does that tell me? Uh, that tells me what wasn't done. Okay. I, I bet but how, I is will... that, how is that evidence that there was something done to try and get a tenant? I mean, the it might seem on... unlikely, but yeah. that's consistent with everybody having... Uh, shut up shop so to speak and done nothing and done nothing to try and find another tenant until they got round to it in december 21. well i mean we obviously we all know the situation for retail shops in uh in 2020 and it took a well, long time for those well, to, COVID, to hit, COVID hit what march of 20. yep yep but one of the the, the problem mr bull is that you're asking me to I don't know, take judicial notice of all these things. Ordinarily, I would have expected um, Mr. McLaughlin or somebody to have actually given evidence of it, to say, uh, for, for example, um, you, you tell me that uh, there were other units in the small that were not occupied. Uh, well, I would have expected that somebody from the or on behalf of the claimant would say what was being done from 2019 or whenever through to December 21 to try and obtain tenants for the units 211, 212, 213 and other units, whether they had to expect them to say, oh, we had a site office, we advertised. Or, or even to go as if it, that was not the case, to put on evidence um, 
that uh, we were required to close the shops. We couldn't advertise. We couldn't do anything to obtain units. But it's just silence. We've just got this. The first units that were let were in December 21. No, yeah. said that that logically is consistent with well, nobody did anything until December 21. And, well, there's another, and there's another matter I wanted to draw to your attention. I saw somewhere, um, I'm not sure if it's Mr. McLaughlin, said uh, something to the effect that steps were taken to, I'm not sure what the right expression is, to register the police with the relevant authority. Um, shortly before that new lease was entered into, or about the time the new lease was entered into. Correct. It's Those steps were taken with the DIFC Registrar of Real Property, uh, but that is merely an administrative process to register uh, the termination of this lease uh, so that the now that the new tenant had been found, that they could register the new lease. Yeah. It's not necessarily inconsistent with steps having been taken in the meantime to try and lease it out. But it's also consistent with, well, nothing was done during that yeah. period. And again, it, it wasn't until uh, around about this December 21 that they got doing anything, which was, uh, amongst other things, taking administrative step to register the termination with the authority and then try to seek a new tenant. All of those yeah. things I'm just left to speculate, aren't I? Well, Your Honour, I can point you towards uh, paragraph um, or well, the witness statement of, of the defendant uh, on okay. 23 August 2024. Well, then let me just find that. Uh, do you know where in the, um, the bundle that is? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'll just, it's section B, part four. Right. It's paragraph 23, which is page 61 of the bundle. Oh, sorry, it's not up. I had it before. Um, page 61, uh, paragraph 24. Okay. Sorry, it's it's not the correct paragraph. Um, I see. Yes. So the defendant says, yes, paragraph twenty-four. I think that's what you're drawing my attention to. The defendant says, from November twenty nineteen onwards, the claimant was carrying on as though the lease had been terminated by looking to lease the premises to a new tenant. Correct. Right, I see. Uh, okay. I cannot, I, we, we cannot dispute, we're in absolute agreement with the defendant's own evidence <laughs> here that uh, from November, um, it was obvious yes. to her that we were trying to find a new tenant. Um, All right. And that those exact steps were being taken to mitigate the loss. Yes, well, that's certainly some evidence. Yes. Perhaps the other the, the other aspect of the um, mitigation might be the rent at which it was then leased. I think it was something. Is it less than half of the? It was less. Um, one of the well, not the, just less, wasn't it? Only about half or something, wasn't it? One of the or issues both. in terms of the the quantum of the lease payable uh, of the rent payable. Um, is that the the rent included the recovery of the million dirham contribution to the fit out and so there is there are witness uh emails uh, i believe in the ross mclaughlin witness statement where the parties address this the claimant note the defendant noted that from the rent agreed in the offer to lease to the rent now agreed in the premises that she had increased from two units to three had increased substantially. And the response from uh, the, the claimant was this is to cover the, 
the, the contribution to the fit out. And she agreed with that. Now the new tenant coming in didn't get a, a fit out contribution and it was the first tenant to come in after a, a very, well, after a, a period of very, you know, of difficulty trying to lease the units within the, within the premises. Well, again, perhaps too late now, but uh, would have been preferable if a witness had said that rather than you having to say it from the bar table, so to speak. Right. Okay. At any event, that's. I appreciate that's that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Your Honour, we've skipped forward to, to that point. Um, All right. Well, I, and, I didn't mean to take you out of your, your course. Go. No, I'm, I, I'm pleased. Your part. I, I am. I am happy to uh, to to right. close on that. Uh, I think we've covered the points that uh, right. are most contentious. All right. So, um, what other points do you want to address? Uh, do you want to address the interest point? Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, the basis in which the, an issue has been taken in terms of the interest. There is a condition in the lease that specifically prescribes that interest on overdue amounts is 15%. And uh, why that doesn't, uh, why that would not be applied, uh, no one seems to have made any, well, any justification for that. I'll give you an opportunity to uh, reply after Mr. Lee has advanced mm -hmm. that, but uh, it seems, I, I assume, I'm not sure whether Mr. Lee's submissions say this or whether I just assumed it to be the case, uh, that uh, this is based on the article in the law of contract. Uh, I've forgotten the number, it might be, uh, where do we have it? We've got the legislation here. Contract law. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the the yes. wheel to stop running uh, and the screen to come good. Mm -hmm. uh, May please, Your Honour, would it assist you if I were to suggest uh, what the number is? 118. Indeed, Your Honour, 118 subsection uh, sub article two to be precise. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Lee. So I, I think the point that's being made is is this, Mr. Bull. And as I say, Mr. Lee, no doubt will put it uh, more eloquently, indeed might put a different position altogether and you can reply to it. But I, I mm -hmm. assume the point was that the provisions section in Article 118 um, are these, uh, subsection one, if a party does not pay a sum of money when it falls due, the aggrieved party is entitled to interest upon that sum from the time when payment is due to the time of payment, whether or not the non-payment is excused. Subsection two, the rate of interest shall be the average bank short-term lending rate to prime borrowers prevailing for the currency of payment at the place for payment. Uh, now there is some reference in the uh, defendant's witness statement to what that rate might be, but without having a figure on it for now, I think the point being made is that the statutory provision provides what the rate of interest is for late payment. And I assume it said that that statutory provision overrides any provision in the contract to the contrary. Uh, Your Honour, I, I, I don't, Believe, I don't understand how this could apply. I mean, it, would the other parties prohibited from agreeing a lower interest rate than this amount? Uh, is that the suggestion? I would find that that highly unusual that an interest rate that is less than the sum prescribed here couldn't be agreed by the parties. Now, contracts entered into in the DIFC uh, inevitably include an interest clause uh, for, for late payments. I would say this applies that if that, that doesn't exist or, or if there is an oral contract where such matters are not addressed. But where the parties have specifically turned their mind to it, uh, I, I appreciate it doesn't note that it's unless otherwise agreed, but 
it just seems to fly in the face of any uh, right of the parties to be able to to bargain the terms of the contract. And yes. um, can't believe that that would be the intention of that provision. Yes. All right. I understand that submission. Mm. Um, what else might there be? Uh, well, perhaps I, I'll let you reply to any other points that Mr. Lee brings up. Thank you, Your Honour. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Bull. Uh, Mr. Lee. Obliged, Your Honour. <clears throat> Your Honour, I start by setting our roadmap of the ground that I propose to cover, and there are six parts to it. Firstly, I spend just a minute or two to set out two key judicial norms governing immediate judgment applications to set a marker. Secondly, I will explain why we say that Ms. Kakari has a real, rather than fanciful, prospect of success on the key points of inflection that go to the heart of the dispute. And I've identified four of these. A, the actual date of termination of the lease. B, whether Ms. Kakari is liable for rent after termination or indeed damages after termination. C, <clears throat> whether Emirates rates claim for late payment interest at 15% is bound to fail. And D, uh, whether there is a lack of mitigation on the part of Emirates rate such that the only damages available to it are reasonable expenses incurred in attempting to reduce its loss. This is going to be quite a black letter law discussion with liberal references to the evidence and a significant part of it Emirates rates own evidence. This will make up the core of my submissions. Then thirdly, I will discuss how Emirates rates has failed to discharge its legal burden to prove that there is no serious question to be tried on any of the defenses raised by Ms. Kakari. Fourthly, uh, I will rebut some points made by my learned friend, Mr. Boo, in the submissions, but I don't expect to take more than a minute or two on that. Fifthly, as a backstop, in discharge of my duty of care to my client. The event that your honour is not with us, that this application should be dismissed outright, I would attempt to persuade your honour that conditional orders might be more appropriate than granting immediate judgment. Oh, this is so especially with regard to the counterclaim as currently pleaded, which I do in intellectual honesty, except is so bereft of particulars, that a claimant might well feel embarrassed in the pursuit of its defence, to use the archaic litigation phrase. However, I hope that that is remedied to some extent by two things. First, the further evidence uh, that Your Honour gave leave to Ms. Kakari to file this week, which abandoned one of the two key prompts of the counterclaim as originally pleaded by her previous counsel. And adding further specifics and an indication of the evidence that a court may expect to receive. Uh, I should also add that I intend, as foreshadowed in my letter to Your Honor, to make an oral application today after my submissions to amend the counterclaim to add particulars. Sixthly and finally, I will tie the threads together by spending a minute or two setting out my preliminary case theory about Emirates rate that I'm confident. I'm cautiously confident of establishing a trial based on the primary documentary evidence. Uh, unless your honour wishes me to proceed in any other way, I will now start by spending a, a minute or two on the first part that I propose to cover. Yes, you needn't spend too long on those those points. The uh, principles uh, yes, are well known to the court and they are set out in, in your submissions. Yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, and I promise it's just a minute or two. Okay. Next. Yes, thank you, Your Honour. Uh, firstly, this court certainly has inherent jurisdiction to dispose an action of defence summarily as frivolous or vexatious if it is so untenable that it cannot possibly succeed. And I should say if and only if it is so untenable. Because this power should never be exercised unless it is clear there is no real question to be tried. And the corollary, of course, is that once it appears there is a real question, whether of fact or of law, 
and the rights of the parties depend on it, then the court should not summarily or immediately dispose uh, of it. Secondly, as set up in the uh, authority in the epigraph of my skeleton, uh, which is a judgment of Mrs. Justice Janine Pritchard sitting in the Supreme Court of West Western Australia, while the respondent to an immediate judgment application, and that's us in our case, bears the evidentiary burden to show a real question to be tried. The applicant, which is Emirates Street in our case, bears the legal burden of establishing there is no real question to be tried. And I believe I've covered that in two minutes. I'll now move on to the... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Honour. <laughs> to my second part. Uh, the first point of inflection, Your Honour, that I will cover is the actual date of termination. Hmm. Yes. Emirates Street says it is 11th December 2021. Ms. Katari on the other where do they say where do they say that, Mr. Uh, in their particulars uh, of the claim, starting from paragraph 30. Right. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I'm so sorry. I should have given you the case bundle reference. Uh case bundle A2, page 8. <laughs> yes. So it's H. To uh, A2 page 8. <clears throat> yes, uh, when your honor is on that and wishes me to proceed, please let me know. Yes, unfortunately, as you probably know, Mr. Lee, sometimes it takes a little while for the page to. Yes, I feel it's come up. So I've got yes. the particulars of claim. Now, what paragraph? Yes. Uh, paragraph 30. 30. Zero. Three zero. Yes. I see. So it's put the claimant effected the necessary administrative steps with the DIFC registrar real property to terminate the lease. Yes. Uh, now, Mr. Bull, I think, did not accept that that was the date on which the lease was terminated, but you say that's the effect of that plea, do you? I would say that the lease is term has been terminated way earlier in right. late 2019. I am now stating uh, Emirates rates case at its highest for your honor's right. reference. Yes. 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 So Emirates rate says it is 11th December 2021. Ms. Kakari, on the other hand, takes the position that the lease was terminated long before, long before Emirates rate found a replacement tenant, and I'm going to propose two dates. Now, let us see what E-rate says first about the date of termination. And as I said, I'm going to do so at its highest by looking at how E-rate, Emirates rate, does so in its own words. If your honour can stay at paragraph 30. Yes. Your honour will see, yes, that what happened on 11th December 2021, the date that Emirates rate says termination took place, was that administrative steps were taken with the DIFC Registrar of Real Property to terminate the lease. Your Honour will note that Emirates Rates Council was careful to say necessary administrative steps, quote unquote. Under DIFC law, as I'll go on to show, such administrative steps are not necessary for termination. So in my submission, the only thing that took place that day was mere formalities for termination, not actual termination. Um, at this point, Your Honour, it's not in my authorities, but I believe that the basis uh, for these administrative steps to be taken uh, is Article 56 uh, of the Leasing Law. Monique, is that correct? Article 56 of the Leasing Law. And if Your Honour uh, were to look at that at leisure, yeah. it is quite clear that Actual termination does not have to depend on that. <clears throat> so in my submission, the only thing that took place that date was the mere formalities for termination, not actual termination. Now, I'm going to suggest the first date of actual termination of 27th October 2019. Because in contrast, your honour note that on 27th October 2019, 
Emirates Suite in itself informed Ms. Kakari that it, uh, it had commenced legal proceedings to terminate the lease. I refer your honour to that email at C6 page 435. When your honour is on it, uh, and when Mr. Booyah on it, uh, I will proceed. Yes, I have it. Oblige your honour. Uh, Mr. Booth, you need me to wait for you. Thank you. Now, that email was not just to recover unpaid rent. If it were just to recover unpaid rent, then it is open to interpretation. I accept the Emirates rate is seeking damages, but nonetheless electing to have the lease remain on foot. But Emirates rate said something very different. It said it was commencing legal action to terminate the lease. So it immediately becomes triable whether that communication constituted an actual termination. This is all the more so when the sender of that email, uh, which your honor will see in the sign off line, is a very senior executive with authority to speak on behalf of Emirates Wait, Mr. Allard, Ms. Alon Deba, group head of real estate portfolios for a company named Equitativa. Now, who is Equitativa? One of Ms. Uh, Emirates Wait's witness statements answer this question, and that was. Uh, uh, the witness statements that Mr. Boo was referring to, uh, that of Mr. Ross Daniel McLaughlin, uh, and if your honours uh, did not mark it earlier, it is uh, C C three page one eight one. Yes, I proceed heard. on. Thank you. Now, we see at paragraph three of that witness statement, quote, Equitativa is the entity that manages the claimant's real estate investment trust, unquote. So we have a very senior person saying unequivocally on behalf of Emirates Street on 27 October 2019 that the termination was then being effected. Emirates rate must be held to that, to the words of Mr. Debar and its import. Now, let us go deeper and look at the legal underpinnings. At law, Emirates rate as lessor may terminate the lease unilaterally. Article 53E of the leasing law says that the lessor may terminate a lease without a court order and without requiring mutual consent if it exercises its rights to terminate the lease in accordance with the terms set up in the lease. And in the disputed lease, uh, we see at clause 10.1a and 10.1e, which are disjunctive requirements. Oh, we see these two disjunctive requirements being fulfilled. 10.1a of the lease says uh, the rent since 1st August 2019 remaining unpaid for a period of 30 days following a notice served by the landlord on the tenant, 10.1e, dishonored check, if there is a dishonored check. Now, we see the evidence for these two at, and I'll give you the case bundle reference, Your Honor. Case bundle C4, page 404 to 409. And that's the formal breach notices dated 25th August 2019 and 3rd September 2019. Your Honour, not one, but two trigger points under the lease for unilateral termination by Emirates rate have occurred. And Emirates rate sending the correspondence, the email of 27 October 2019, can only be an exercise of its right to terminate the lease in accordance with the terms set out in the lease. And to reinforce the point that Emirates rate exercise its right to terminate, as of 27 October 2019, we set out two further sets of conduct by Emirates Wait, which reinforces this understanding at paragraph 10A and 10B of my skeleton, which I do not propose to read out as it is quite extensively canvassed there. I'll just repeat the paragraph numbers for you on a read at leisure, 10A and 10B of my skeleton. Now, yes. Yes. 
I do now have further evidence of the criminal action mentioned at paragraph 10b, and that is found at paragraph 6 to 7 and exhibit VK2, page 2 to 28 of Ms. Kakari's supplemental witness statement, which uh, Your Honour gave permission to be filed. Yes. Yes. So we say we thus have enough tribal material giving Ms. Kakari a real prospect of success in establishing the termination of the lease occurred on 27th October 2019 by Emirates Rates Unilateral Conduct. Dates, Your Honour, which I would propose in the alternative and as a backstop. It's 10th November 2019. Sorry, what date? 10th November 2019. Yes. Yes. Uh, around two weeks after the first date that I mentioned. So if your honour is not with us that the lease was terminated as of 27th October 2019, we say alternatively that it is triable as to whether Emirates rates conduct on 10th November, constituted termination. Now, Your Honour, we have set out in full the curious Wofley drafting at paragraph 26F to H of Emirates Rates reply and defence to counterclaim at paragraph 11 of my skeleton. It looks like the kind of drafting as advocates we know to be the approach of saying enough so as to avoid accusations of concealing material facts, but withholding enough so as not to get that party's case into trouble. Now, let me go on a subparagraph by subparagraph analysis. First, at subparagraph F, Emirates Rates complains about Ms. Kakare not making effort to remedy the defaults that uh, she had been notified of. Then, at subparagraph G, there is language suggesting that re-entry by the landlord was proper and legitimate. Quote, the value of the fit-out works completed on-site were the minimis and nothing of value had been left by the defendant or the fit-out contractor, unquote. And I say this because in the real estate tenancy contract, one of the biggest risks of a landlord in re-entry is a subsequent complaint by the tenant saying that things of value had disappeared saying that things had been destroyed, and so on. Now, and after that, at, within the same subparagraph G, Emirates rate then makes a conceptual leap and says that the lease was effectively terminated by the conduct of both parties. Both parties, quote unquote, why did Emirates rate have to say both parties if Emirates rate had not by its conduct terminated the lease as of 10th November? if not earlier. Emirates Wade was thus far only complaining about the conduct of Ms. Kakari, and Emirates Wade need not have said that the lease was terminated by Emirates Wade's own conduct, unless I suggest that was indeed the case. So what was the conduct on the part of Emirates Wade that terminated the lease, if uh, it was not terminated on the uh, 1st of, sorry, 27th of October, but on the 10th of November, 2019. Your Honour, it is my submission that there are two possibilities, both triable. The first, taking into account the language of subparagraph G, which, which hints at re-entry, is of course actual re-entry. This is because of what I just mentioned about the real estate tenancy context, the risk of the tenant turning around and saying that things of value have been taken. So the language is redolent of actual re-entry. The second possibility is that Emirates Rate might have had started the search for a replacement tenant as of 10th November. Your Honour had a dialogue with Mr. Bull on this, and Mr. Bull characterised it as our evidence. Um, if I may just say something about that, it is our inference from uh, Mr. Bull's client's own pleadings. So it's not our evidence that, uh, yes, there was search for a replacement tenant as of that date. It was an inference that we're drawing. Now, 
so both possibilities arguably are to use the language of Article 53C of the leasing law. Uh, Emirates rate exercising its rights to terminate the lease in accordance with the terms set out in the lease. To sum up, it is a tribal issue as to whether Emirates rate had re-entered the premises. And it is also a tribal issue if it started a search for the replacement tenant by then, then being 10th November 2019. I go further. If actual re-entry is established at trial to your honour's satisfaction, I draw your honour's attention to Article 55.4 of the DIFC Real Property Law, uh, which can be found at uh, G4 of the case bundle, page 635. Yes, and Your Honour, I forgot to give you the reference to Article 53C of the leasing law in the bundle. Uh, it is at G3, page 633. Yes, Your Honour, if I were to uh, come back to Article 55.4 of the real property law. Your Honour, see that the language is in terms of implied power to re-enter the lease premises and terminate the lease. Now, at common law, the re-entry re of premises comes together with forfeiture or termination of the lease. And it is, in my submission, why power, quote unquote, in the law is expressed in the singular rather than plural, because re-entry and termination come together. The conjunctive and is also used to link re-entry and termination rather than or, or even and or. So the word and, quote unquote, must mean something. So we say if re-entry is established, then termination of the lease happens by the very fact of re-entry. And if actual re-entry did take place on 10th November 2019, then termination would have taken place as of that date. Yes. Yes. And before leaving this point and going on to whether damages stop after termination, I add one more gloss to the analysis. Even if actual re-entry did not take place, it is a tribal issue as to whether constructive re-entry might have had taken place, given that being careful about there being nothing of value on the premises and searching for a replacement tenant was already in Emirates Rates' mind as of that date. In any event, it is not in dispute that as of 10th November 2019, Mr. Kari was already being barred from entry. Mr. Debar's 29th October 2019 email mentioned eviction. So Ms. Kari, as of 29th October 2019, and certainly 10th November 2019, did not enjoy any possession, which supports the analysis of constructive re-entry on the landlord's part. If constructive if constructive re-entry occurred, the same analysis that I covered earlier, linking re-entry with termination, applies equally. I now move on, Your Honour, uh, to the next point of inflection, which is whether damages stop after termination. If we succeed at trial on any of these two termination dates in 2019, then the next triable issue on which we say Ms. Kakari has a real prospect of success is whether damages stop flowing after the date of the termination, be it 27th October or 10 November 2019. I note that the written lease purports to provide at clause 5.1e, and that's at the uh, C4 of the case bundle, pages 358 to 359, Clause 51E purports to provide that the tenant remains obliged to make payment for a period after termination. The efficacy of this clause is triable because firstly, as I pointed out in my skeleton, it is contrary to written law, namely Article 89 of the DIFC contract law. And I've set out Article 89 extensively at paragraph 17 of my skeleton. Article 89 of the contract law permits of no contracting out. 
Even if it does, then clear words unequivocally denoting that there is contracting out unnecessary and that is not present in our case. Secondly, and here is where it gets interesting on the textual analysis, from a textual analysis perspective, let's look at the phrase, quote, for a period before or after that time, unquote. Your Honour, this is my submission that that is too vague and on a true construction, it could very well be the case that the clause could be invalid and unenforceable for lack of certainty. And I submitted an additional authority, that of the DIFC Court of Appeals judgment in Vajibar and Emirates National Bank properties yesterday. The discussion starts at paragraph 69 of that judgment. The uncertainty in that case was also, like in our case, one of time frames. And in that case, specifically, the commencement date of the lease in that case. Let's trace the judicial analysis in that case. At paragraph 71, the Court of Appeal quotes the Court of First Instance Judge, Justice Omar al muhairi as saying that it would be, quote, unenforceable because it did not state the time frame, unquote. And Judge Omar, sorry, and Justice al muhairi relies on the English authority of Blue and Ashley. Now we come to interesting part. The Court of Appeal adds a gloss of its own to reinforce the analysis at paragraph 73 and 74. Quote, to that requirement, it asked the requirement of certainty is added in the case of a lease that it is an interest in land and must have a commencement date for the property right to come into being. It is right that a lease must have a stated or ascertainable commencement date the lease does not. The commencement date is doubly uncertain, unquote. Now, I skip ahead, I'll skip a couple of sentences ahead, Your Honour, and the court then goes on to complain that there is, quote, no measure of how the commencement date is to be adjusted or revised or in any way arrived at. There is no objective standard, not even the concept of reasonable time, to resolve the certain uncertainty. The court does not fix the date for the parties, unquote. In my submission, this is fully analogous to our complaint about Clause 5.1e of the lease in our of the disputed lease in our instant case. Clause 5.1e essentially says a tenant, notwithstanding expiry or termination, quote unquote. And Your Honor, while I focus on termination here, I have something to say about the appearance of the word expiry in a while. Has obligations to quote make payments under this lease for a period before or after that time, unquote. And that time, of course, must refer to termination. Your Honour, the question then becomes, what period? Two weeks? Two months? Two years? 20 years? Two weeks, two months, two years, 20 years. All are possible periods on the literal interpretation of that clause. So I echo what the Court of Appeals said in the Vajibar case. There is no objective standard in that clause, not even the concept of a reasonable time, to resolve the uncertainty. And I promise a few words about the word expiry. When we consider the appearance of the word expiry, this clause gets even more ludicrous. We have a situation where the lease has ended, the tenant no longer has rights of occupation, but under this clause still could well have a residual obligation to pay beyond the tenor of the lease. In my respectful submission, Your Honour, this clause 5.1e is right for judicial striking down. There's one day a landlord in the DIFC with a similar clause decides to use that clause to claim for rent from a tenant for an exorbitant period beyond the actual term of the lease. Uh, before turning to the third part of my submissions, which is, sorry, um, not yet. Uh, I now move on to uh, the lack of mitigation. Uh, and I think your honor has really apprehended that point uh, earlier. I do not propose to repeat what is in my written submissions. I would like to point out that this is one issue which Ms. Kakari has responded. Can I just go back, back Mr. Lee, to your Your point about whether damages stop on termination? Yes. Uh, In the absence of clause 5.1e, Yes. the, The ordinary contractual principles and it is reflected in the DIFC contract law, is that on termination of, on breach of a lease, the 
innocent party is entitled to damages, being loss of bargain damages for the breach. Uh, and that includes where the contract, or this case, the lease is terminated. In the ordinary course, if the tenant breaches the lease, the landlord terminates the lease. The landlord is entitled, is it not, to damages being loss of bargain damages for that breach. If I understand uh, your order correctly, I think that uh, Article 89 of the contract law might be the answer. Article 89 1 says termination of the contract releases both parties from their obligation to effect and to receive future performance. Yes. Your Honor, I would read that. And even if Your Honor is not with me on this, I would say it's a tribal issue as to whether damages stop flow, whether on a true construction of Article uh, 89.1, uh, damages stop flowing from the termination of the future con uh, con uh, termination of the contract by virtue of the word to receive future performance, quote unquote, because future yeah. performance refers that, to the time that, of Mr. Lee. Um, yes, releasing the. Uh, in this case, if I use the expression guilty party, the party who's breached the contract, yes. releasing that party from the obligation to further performance under the lease yes. is a different matter than yes. whether or not the innocent party is entitled to damages caused by the breach of the contract. And 89.1 is releasing, in effect, both yes. parties from further performance of the contract. Yes. But it doesn't yes. prevent the innocent party from recovering damages flowing from the breach of the contract. Your Honour, in all intellectual honesty, I am with you on this. If yeah. I, as a tenant, simply decides I don't like this property anymore and I decide to move out and go to somewhere else, and the poor landlord may already have had been uh, anticipating that there would be uh, returns from leasing it to me rather than someone else, then I'll be leaving that landlord high and dry. Uh, Your Honour, I am going only as far as what the uh, Article 89.1 says, and I will leave my submissions at that because in all intellectual honesty, I see your honest point. I think that's right, Mr. Lee, and, and the yes. point I think should be seen in terms of 89.2 as well, which termination does not preclude a claim for damages for non-performance. So the distinctions being drawn between under 89.1, an obligation to... Yes future performance, 89 to damages for non-performance, which in effect damages for breach. Your Honour, if we, I take your Honour's point, and if we do go to trial, I will improve my case <laughs> on this point <laughs> in light of what your Honour has just uh, All right. uh, pointed out to me. Okay. Yes. Yes. Your Honour, um, I stopped earlier at this uh, point that I would like to point out that there is one issue which Ms. Kakari, as the respondent, bears the evidentiary burden on under the law of immediate judgment, but because the duty of mitigation and actual steps taken to mitigate are the applicants, all the information as to the extent to which Emirates rate mitigated, even at all, is in Emirates rate's hands. So we trust that your honour is with us that on this particular defence, the evidentiary burden of proof should fairly rest with Emirates Wade and not Ms. Kakari. And if you're honest with, with us on this, then we make two observations. The evidence from Emirates Wade is very bare. And we were looking earlier at the witness statement of Mr. McLaughlin, and I think that your honor has apprehended what I'm not next going to say. So there is a single witness statement filed in this regard of, in regard of mitigation. 
by Mr. McLaughlin. And Mr. McLaughlin is the head of real estate for Equitativa. Uh, and we have already gone through what Equitativa is. At paragraph two, your honor, it says that he, Mr. McLaughlin joined Equi Equitativa just last October, long after the lease was dead ah. on either day. Yes. Okay. So Mr. McLaughlin certainly has no personal knowledge of what efforts were taken by Emirates Rate to procure a replacement tenant during the period from 2019 to 2021. I should add that Emirates Rates, Mr. Alan Debar, who sent a termination email of 27 October 2019, was, if, I'm, if my memory serves me right, originally listed as the factual witness. But now we have a situation where Mr. Debar did not leave any factual testimony, only Mr. McLaughlin, and we do not know the reason. I venture one reason, in fairness to my opponent, the titles look similar. It could simply well be a matter of Mr. Devar having left his post and Mr. Uh, and Mr. McLaughlin step, stepping in. But uh, well, as to the actual reason, uh, only uh, Emirates rates. Emirates rates knows. Mr. McLaughlin's testimony is one of going through multiple internal emails that he has access to in order to make his assertions. And even though it is clear he had access to and looked through a good number of internal emails on the issue of delay, curiously, none of these emails mention any internal efforts to look for a replacement tenant. Yet, let's go to paragraph 49 of his witness statement. Your Honor, if I may ask you to turn to paragraph 49 of his witness statement. Forty-nine? Forty-nine, yes. At 49, having seen no internal emails, no documents at all, or any internal efforts taken to find a replacement tenant, Mr. McLaughlin then startlingly ventures to give an opinion, which he says is expert opinion, that no replacement tenant could have been found during the two-year period. Your Honour, it is bizarre and entirely unsatisfactory for a factual witness to suddenly put on the mantle of an expert. In my respectful submission, Mr. McLaughlin had to make that conceptual leap from factual witness to expert witness, simply because there were no actual efforts of mitigation for him to go on with. At the very least, it is trouble as to whether there were actual efforts to mitigate. And here I seek your honest indulgence in not requiring me to amplify any further. Otherwise, I'll be giving away my cross-examination questions for Mr. McLaughlin and preempting him before uh, any trial that your honour may be minded to order. I see. Thank you. Yes. The final point of inflection, fourth and final point of inflection, the 15% interest. This 15% interest forms one of the three heads of Emirates Rates claim. Now, your honour would note the language of Article 1182 of the DIFC contract law. And I note that your honour has already noted it in your dialogue with Mr. Bull earlier. Quote, the rate of interest shall be the average bank short-term lending rate to prime borrowers prevailing for the currency of payment at the place for payment, unquote. And that's at the bundle G1629. Yes, Your Honour, that phrase is quite a mouthful, and I hope to be able to, to contract it to the average rate applicable to prime borrowers. So in the rest of my submissions, when I refer to the applicable rate, uh, the average rate applicable to prime borrowers, I'm referring to this rate. We have preliminary, yes, Your Honour, we, we, we have preliminary evidence, uh, and that's in the uh, Ms. Kakari's supplementary witness statement filed this week at paragraph 11 and exhibit VK2, pages 29 to 32, indicating that this is 12%. 15% interest fails the requirements of Article 1182. Now, why do I say that? 
sorry, before that, uh, let me just back up a bit and say 15% interest falls, fails the requirements of Article 1182. And the validity of the 15% interest is triable. I will go even further and say that a 15% provision in the lease can be held void for illegality. In the additional, uh, does your honor have the specific clause in the lease which refers to 15% interest? Uh, yes, I think it's yes. Uh, 11.6. Yes, 11.6, your honor. That's right. In the additional authority that I tendered yesterday, which is the DIFC Court of First Instances judgment in the same Veggie Bar and Emirates National Bank case. If your honor would go to paragraph 105, it sets out that a contractual clause being void for illegality is an available defense under DIFC law. I quote the relevant part of paragraph 105. Quote, I find that the defendant puts forward a very compelling case that performance of the lease was impossible in law. And as a result, even if the lease was binding on Emirates, it would be unenforceable. Indeed, it is a well-known tenet of contract law that a contract entered into for the purpose of doing an act prohibited by statute would be illegal and unenforceable. This argument at the apex of the defense is well thought out and clearly the correct application of the law. It demonstrates that such pleadings would likely succeed should this case have gone to trial and court. Your Honor, in fairness, I would now like to point a weak link in my own case that arises from the language of this ratio and which is why perhaps Mr. Bull says he does not quite understand my case on this point. The requirement is that a court be, quote, uh, sorry, that the act, the requirement is that the act be, quote, prohibited by statute, unquote. The question then becomes, does Article 1182 go as far as to prohibit the lessor from imposing a rate that is higher than the average rate applicable to prime borrowers? On a literal reading of Article 1182, there is no prohibitory language. So my argument appears to run into difficulties since the authority of Vegiba requires that to be a prohibited act, quote, unquote. But in my respectful submission, the correct counterfactual for analysis in understanding Article 118 correctly is this. But for the existence of Article 1182, would a lessor be able to impose a higher rate than the average rate applicable to prime borrowers? And I say the answer to that counterfactual is yes. Because Article 1182 says that the contractual interest rate shall be the average rate applicable to prime borrowers. The phrase shall be does the work of imposing a ceiling on contractual interest chargeable. We take away Article 1182 and there will be no ceiling. Of course. Your Honor, and here is where I debate against myself again, <laughs> against myself again. In all intellectual honesty, the natural question that can then be asked is, does Article 1182 impose the average rate as a floor to? I will just venture a preliminary thought that would be perverse to construe it as a floor for public policy reasons. So Your Honor, while the DIFC is a carved out free zone, it remains territory of the Dubai, of the wider UAE which is ultimately an Islamic jurisdiction, where we have to be very careful about interest, which in many contexts is forbidden, unless expressly allowed by statute. The DIFC requires legitimacy, which could well be lost by requiring parties to agree to a minimum interest that cannot be lower than the average rate applicable to prime borrowers. Whether I'm right or I'm wrong, whatever the answer is, I'm happy to say to your honor, that today, we are not in the territory where that question has to be decided. Because the material facts in our case happens to be where we have a 15% interest rate, which is 300 basis points or 3% higher than the average rate applicable to prime borrowers, rather than one which is lower 
than the average rate applicable to prime borrowers. So your honor may legitimately reserve the question as to whether article 1182 acts as a flaw to be decided another day. The third part, the main part of my submissions, your honor, uh, is that I will make some points about how Emirates rate as the applicant for immediate judgment has failed to discharge its legal burden. And this is a short section, which is just two pages on my speaking notes, font size 18, uh, double, almost uh, 1.5 times spacing. So on the key defenses that I've covered so far, Emirates rate has not grappled with any of my points of inflection, much less cited any legal authority against my points of inflection to show that our defenses are without merit. The, the termination event on 11 December 2021 they rely on, they themselves had said it was an administrative steps. With reference to whether the email of 27 October 2019 constitutes termination, the leasing law is on the side of Ms. Kakari, and Emirates rate has tended no viable arguments against that. On their own accounts with regard to whether 10th November, uh, oh, sorry, even their own account with regard to 10th November 2019 is redolent of re-entry, either actual or constructive, and hence forfeiture, termination of the lease. With reference to their duty to mitigate, which is their positive duty, the factual witness they rely on who has access to much internal correspondence suddenly has no internal correspondence to refer to demonstrating active attempts at, the, at mitigation and has to equally suddenly assume the mantle of an expert to make the point that it was impossible to lease out the property in the two plus years. With reference to whether damages continue to flow after termination, I have your honest uh, submission, uh, sorry, my apologies. I have your honest guidance on it and uh, I will stand guided uh, in future contracts of uh, proceedings if your honor were to direct that. Um, with reference to the 15% interest, it is higher than what at least a UAE national law firm says to be 12% on which we have the sounder argument that article 1182 operates as a ceiling prohibiting a lessor from charging a higher interest. Your Honour, uh, the fourth part uh, of what I said uh, will be the six parts. I'm going on is a rebuttal. And I think it is my respectful submission that Emirates Rate has failed to apprehend my case. So seriously, I do not have much rebuttal to make. Uh, and the fifth part, which is the penultimate part before I set up my preliminary case theory. Uh, and that's the backstop in discharge of my duty of care to my clients. Uh, and perhaps I should take guidance from your honor as to whether I need to make submissions on whether conditional and conditional order rather than uh, uh, whether conditional order might be a better uh, approach to take. Yes, where do you refer to that in your submissions? Uh, I have only set out the law, but I have not said much on it. Your Honour, the submissions. What, what yes, conditions? The law on conditional order. Yes, uh, it might be relevant with regard to the counterclaim. And let me take you to the relevant paragraph of my counterclaim, paragraph three. Yeah. Where I set out, yes, uh, various rules of the DIFC. What's yeah. Yes, uh, your honor, uh, my uh, colleague has just reminded me to say specifically it's paragraph three of my skeleton. <coughs> yes, I see. Yes, and I cite various rules of the uh, yes courts. Uh, so, uh, 24.11 uh, uh, says a conditional order uh, may be ordered by the court. 24.12 says it appears to the court possible that a claim of defense may succeed, but improbable that it will do so. The court may make a conditional order. 
24.13 says the conditional order is an order which requires a party to pay of some to pay a sum of money into court or to take a specified step in relation to his claim or defense, as the case may be, and provides that the party's claim will be dismissed or his statement of case will be struck out if he does not comply. And I believe, Your Honour, as I mentioned at the start of my submissions, in all intellectual honesty, the counterclaim as currently pleaded is so bereft of particulars that it would reasonably put the claimant in a difficult position. But, Your Honour, I have already started outlining through Ms. Katari's witness statement uh, the evidence, the nature of the counterclaim, and the nature of the evidence that the court can expect to receive. And Your Honour would also see that I have taken care uh, and on this point, Ms. Kakari, my client concurs with me, to drop the counterclaim insofar as it pertains to the tort of malicious prosecution. I think that helpful, yes, yes. So, so what's the but you maintain the counterclaim adverted to in paragraph 55 of the Indeed, amendment. Your Honour. Yes. What, what, can you just take me to tell me what that's about? Certainly, Your Honour. Um, so I, 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 yes. So we will be focusing on business losses suffered by Ms. Kakari arising from late handover. I have to make it clear, Your Honour, that the current disputed lease was to replace two previous leases that parties signed, commencing 15 December 2017 and 1st April 2018, mm -hmm. respectively. Yes. Uh, and Your Honour is aware of this from your dialogue with uh, Mr. Bull earlier. Yes. The delay period of, for handover and that's common ground between parties from the correspondence mentioned at paragraph 21 of Ms. Kakari's supplementary witness statement from Emirates Way itself was until February 2019. So there was a delay in handover until February 2019. So Ms. Kakari never enjoyed occupation under the two previous leases simply because of the delay in handover. Legally speaking, therefore, the factual substratum for the counterclaim comes under the two previous leases rather than the current disputed lease. But I say your honour has jurisdiction in this case to hear the counterclaim, even though it is in respect of the two previous leases, because the counterclaim arises in connection with a disputed lease, even though it does not arise out of the disputed lease, and the law and jurisdiction clause in our disputed lease gives your honour jurisdiction over a dispute arising in connection with and not just arising out of the disputed lease. So the losses will be quantified with reference to a business plan that Ms. Kakari had filed with the DIFC when procuring the previous leases. So it is not just some business plan that was made up as an afterthought for purposes of this litigation, or more specifically, this counterclaim. It was one duly filed with the DIFC as a condition of being able to procure the previous leases. And for the evidence on this, I refer your honour to the checklist at case bundle C4, page 204. 204. Four. Four. Page 204, or C4. You want to see a checklist of which business plan and, uh, uh, and uh, makes up one of the items on the checklist. Clause four. Uh, my uh, colleague has just reminded me that it is under clause four on that page. Yes, unfortunately, it hasn't come up on my screen yet. Ah, I see, Your Honour, sorry. I was <laughs> taking your <laughs> silence as <laughs> looking at a page yes, and not being yes. able to find that. Yes. Unfortunately, I've still got the spinning wheel telling me they're trying to load it. I understand, Your Honour. Uh, and I'm actually very grateful for this break because I'm 
rather thirsty, and <laughs> I will just take the chance to have a drink yes. of water. Yes, do that. Just. Yes, I have the page now. Yes. So you want to look at section four of that page that one of the items on the checklist is business plan. Can you read business plan? Yes. And I'm just trying to see whether there's any more language after the phrase business. Mm. Plans. Yes, uh, business plan and business concept presentation. So this shows that this was something that was actually filed with the DIFC, not something that was made up for purposes of this counterclaim. And your honor can expect Ms. Kakari to furnish that as evidence should uh, the counter uh, should the counterclaim be allowed to proceed. Now, Emirates rate, of course, attributes the delay that I just mentioned to Ms. Kakari. In fact, that appears to be the substantial focus of Emirates rates because both factual witnesses. Both factual witness statements filed by it, by Mr. McLaughlin and uh, Mr. George Frank, are all on delay. But in my submission, Emirates, K, Emirates rates case at best shows there is concurrent delay, and it is tribal as to whether Emirates rates culpability in the delay was so material that it does not disentitle Ms. Kakari to her business losses counterclaim. Yes, your honor. I unless your honor has any further questions for me on this point, no. I now move. I know. Yes, your honor. On, yes. On on this point, um, I'm sorry. I'll just go back to that page. The um, I think Mr. Bull's point is that the entry in by the parties entering into the 2019 lease. They, Mr. Bull's words, I think, were renounced the two earlier leases. Uh, that is, um, in effect, that they abandoned the two previous leases, waived any rights under those leases to enter into on any um, entitlement to damages from those leases by entering into the new lease. Uh, and he says that's to be implied from the fact that the uh, new lease covered, at least overlapped the dates on which the previous lease operated, that there were payments that were made under the previous lease that were uh, transferred to or deemed or treated as having been made under the new lease. Uh, and there's a entire contract clause, merger clause in the new lease. All of those things, and there might have been more things that Mr. Bull referred to, but those things, uh, Mr. Bull says, are impliedly amount to a renunciation or abandonment of the previous leases and a waiver of any rights that may have existed under the previous leases. What do you say about all that? Yes, your Honor, I was following that dialogue with uh, interest. Yes. Uh, firstly, um, if I have heard correctly, and I have no instructions on this yet, yes. uh, I'm paraphrasing what uh, Mr. Bull has said, uh, payments made for marketing fees, etc., under the first lease yes. were transferred to the second lease. I don't know whether it is Mr. Bull's case that they were also then transferred to the third lease. That's the first point. On this, I have no instructions. I do not wish to be giving evidence from the bar. Second is, if I may refer to Ms. Kakari's supplementary witness statement filed earlier this week, mm -hmm. at paragraph 23, we have... You see that Emirates rate did not ask me, and that's Ms. Kakari, to forgive its breaches under the previous leases. And I did not agree to forgive breaches by Emirates rates under the previous leases when entering into the disputed lease. 
And as far as I can see, Your Honor, and I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong, there is no forgiveness language at all in the disputed deeds. I hear what Your Honor says about entire agreement. Uh, entire agreement, to my understanding, are the um, uh, are the rights. Uh, they refer to the rights and obligations as between the parties under that particular contract. But it does not obviate. Uh, it does not obviate frustrated rights, frustrated obligations uh, under previous contracts uh, from being made subject of a claim. And even if, even at the lowest, Your Honor, I say that what I've just said are tribal issues. Yes. Yes. May I have Your Honor's permission to proceed to the sixth and last yes. part of yes, Your yes, Honor. please, Mr. Lee. Thank you. So here's where I promise a preliminary case theory, which I'm cautiously confident of being able to establish a trial. My case theory is this. Emirates Rate had intended to terminate the lease as of 27 October 2019, and it did terminate it by unilateral act, uh, namely Mr. Uh, which is evidenced by Mr. Alon Debar's email. Emirates Rate might well have started re-entry with a view to looking for a new tenant by 10th of November 2019. This was before COVID happened, and Emirates Rate had every confidence that it was able to find a new tenant shortly and saw it fit to take a high-handed approach with Ms. Kakari on the termination of the lease. But essentially, Emirates Rate did not make, in fact, make serious effort to look for a new tenant from the time Emirates Rate evicted Ms. Kakari until a new tenant took over on 12th December 2021, more than two years on. Subsequently, when Emirates Rate found a replacement tenant to start from 12 December 2021, it then took what it called necessary administrative steps from the 8th of December 2021 to effectively terminate the lease on 11 December 2021. And this 11 20, December 2021 date on Emirates Rate's own admission was administrative and a formality. True termination took place as of 27 October 2019, or shortly after. On the evidence before us, never once did Emirates Rate commence this case. Uh, uh, never once, never once, until until Emirates Rate commenced this commenced this case, the Emirates Rate press for payments from end 2019 or early 2020 to expiry of lease, which is earlier this year. Uh, Your Honor, I qualify that by saying that I'm still taking instructions from Ms. Kakari and uh, there was a mention, I've asked her to get me a translation of the civil checks execution case that was fought by Emirates rates in the municipal courts of Dubai. Uh, and I want uh, to see that in English first, uh, to see whether Emirates rates uh, had actually uh, pressed for uh, a payment of rent after and 2019, before uh, I say that, you know, uh, before I, uh, I cast what I just said in stone. Now, it is only after 5th September 2023, when e issued its claim form, that M Ms. Kakari knew for the first time that Emirates Rate was pursuing unpaid rent and services charges for a far more extended period of time than what she had previously uh, been pursued for. And to substantiate the claim in this litigation, Emirates Rate relies heavily on the administratively recorded termination on 11 December 2021 in its particulars of claim, even as it was careful to state that what happened on 11 December 2021 were administrative steps. Emirates Rate, at the same time, assiduously avoided referring to Mr. Debar's email of 27 October 2019 which clearly said that Emirates Rate was terminating the lease. In the final analysis, I say, Emirates Rate is approbating and reprobating to suit its own preferences 
as to the quantum of rent it can recover. And for the reasons that I have covered in my submissions today, my respectful submission that this is not a case where the court should exercise its jurisdiction to grant immediate judgment to the claimant and should allow the case to proceed to trial for justice to be done. Ms. Curry must be given a chance to demonstrate that she is not liable for the period of damages that Emirates rate says uh, she uh, that uh, says she is liable for, and the claimant must be put to strict proof of its claim that termination took place only on 11 December 2021, and that damages uh, float beyond that until the end of the lease. There is enough evidence showing delay on the part of the claimant that Ms. Kakari must be afforded the chance to show that the delay caused her business losses and to counter claim for that accordingly. Unless yes. I may assist uh, your honor any further, I've come to the end of my submissions to resist immediate judgment. All right, well, thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Oblige, now, your honor. Now, Mr. Bull in reply. Uh, thank you, your honor. I um, will have trouble touching on all of those points. Um, in relation to the date of October 27, there's clear evidence uh, by the, client, the defendant herself that she considered the lease still to be on foot. Uh, she had her lawyers uh, send an e a letter uh, on the 10th of November where they said that, uh, well, they essentially put forward a, um, uh, a demand that unless she was given an extra two months to comply, to finish her fit out, uh, only on that basis would she then proceed to uh, adhere to the terms of the lease in good faith. Um, so clearly in the 10th of November, the defendant was of the view that the lease was still on foot. She only considered the lease to have been uh, terminated uh, later in November and December. Um, I will go back to some of my notes that I prepared before that uh, that I had skipped over, and I and I just point to the fact that um, the claimant has pointed to the use of the words. Uh, sorry, I'll just find the paragraph uh, where I've referred to the, the lease was effectively terminated by the conduct of the parties. Now, I wrote this um, by reference, and, and what I was alluding to is Article 87.1 of the DIFC Law of Contract, uh, which provides that the right of a party to terminate the contract is exercised by notice to the other party. Now, in this case, there was no explicit notice, uh, written or oral, served by the claimant to the defendant, stating that the lease had been terminated. However, as we can see, uh, as noted in the conduct of the parties, the termination was affected uh, through through the conduct of, of the claimant. And likewise, the defendant's conduct acknowledged that that information had been received. So paragraph 36 of the claimant skeleton arguments, uh, I make this point and refer to the House of Lords decision in Vitol and Norelf. Uh, in that case, it was held that communication by oral or written message was not always uh, would not always be necessary to terminate a contract. Now, the criteria is whether the innocent party's act or omissions unequivocally conveyed to the party in breach that the innocent party elected to treat the contract as repudiated. This is what occurred in this case here. And, and as I sought to highlight when I wrote, uh, the lease was effectively, term, effectively terminated by the conduct of the parties. At paragraph 28 of the defendant's witness statement, uh, which is at page 428 of the bundle. The defendant stated, given they had commenced criminal proceedings against me in Bird Dubai police station before they sent me this letter, which was dated the 15th of December in this context, to me that meant that our business relationship had ended with the result that I could not take any further steps in respect of completing the fit out of the works on the premises in order to trade and make payments to the claimant. Going on to say, paragraph 29, this understanding was reinforced by the fact that in January 2022, uh, sorry, that would be January 2020, my, my mistake. 
um, that the claimant tried to take action against me in the onshore Dubai courts. And in paragraph 24 of the defendant's witness statement dated 23 of August, one that we've already touched on today, she said from November 29 onwards, the claimant was carrying on as though the lease had been terminated. So we, my learned friend is uh, steering the court away from the termination being affected in December of 2021. Um, and and I, I concede, I agree on that point that that the termination was affected prior to that. Um, but my point remains the same in that affected prior to when? Prior to the prior to the December 21 date. Um, that it appears that by about late mid-November to December, both parties considered the lease as terminated and conducted themselves in, in that, that manner. Um, and it is the defendant's own evidence that the claimant from that point was trying to re-let the premises. Now, as we know, the market conditions well, that take, followed... Take, take me again uh, where she says that. Uh, yeah, paragraph, paragraph 24, I believe. 24. Yeah, paragraph 24, uh, page 61 of the bundle. Oh. Now, the so defendant... Just, just so, give me a minute. I just wanted to look at those, the wording yeah, there. Correct. Uh, 61, paragraph 24. Now, what Mr. I understood Mr. Lee to be saying that what the defendant is there setting out is the inference she has drawn from what the defendant uh, claimant said it was doing, not giving evidence of her own observations or knowledge. Indeed, one might question how she would know whether or not the uh, claimant was looking to lease the premises to a new tenant. I think of, of everyone uh, in the industry who is uh, looking at rentals in the, in the retail market, she would be one of the most interested to see that this property was being advertised as available for rent. Mm, okay. and, and perhaps uh, would be one of the first people to, to notice uh, that coming up mm. the the point made about uh there not being emails internally about the reletting of these units and the client the, the the claimant in this case is a listed retail investment trust it has multitude of properties hundreds if not thousands of tenants and the process of letting a unit, a retail premises, one of 20 within this small, but one of thousands within their portfolio, is not something that, that warrants the internal uh, emails and concern about. This is all set out to the uh, leasing agents who go about trying to re-let any vacant property um, and, and our client is under an obligation to its a fiduciary obligation to its unit holders to generate as much revenue as it can from these properties. But if it, if there is an agent that is responsible for leasing, then you would expect there would be emails, notices, something from the agent, wouldn't you? Um, I don't think it should be looked at, the absence of those emails, I don't believe should be looked at as the absence of an effort to try and relet the premises. There is there is a consensus that in November, they started to look to try and relet the premises. The defendant has said that, the claimant has submitted that. Where, where, the, does, the claim, where does the claimant say that? Okay, I apologize for that. The claimant's evidence, uh, the, the statement, yeah. Um, the claimant's position is that it is a retail investment trust. It has a fiduciary obligation to be generating revenue from these units. It they, There were multitude of vacant properties in that um, mall uh, from October 2020 
up until December 2021, uh, sorry, October 2019. So before this lease was terminated, they found tenants for, for, for Fitness Lab. And then there was a, a shortage of tenants, uh, a shortage of interest, and then where, COVID where, where hit. Is, where is the evidence of that, Mr. Bull? Yeah, okay. It, it's, it is only by the fact that there was just nothing let uh, after that date yes. of October 20, uh, 2019, that there was, there was no units that were let. But uh, I would, on the balance of probabilities, an invest, a real estate, real estate investment trust would not leave uh, the, the entire index mall a vacant, say for only a few tenants without making efforts to try and let those units. And then when it did, when that opportunity came up, uh, it came up in an entirely different market, a post COVID era, the Dubai was a changed place and the, the first unit to let in, in our index tower was taken at a rate that was perhaps lower than that which was offered to the to the tenant but at the same time it, if it I take, wasn't I inclusive to stop you there because yep. i want to go back a few months okay if i in effect take judicial notice that covid caused uh, lockdowns in dubai starting in march of 2020 mm -hmm. Well, we've still got either from October 27 or late November, December through to March, yep. where the environment then was not, there was no problems caused. It wasn't a, a COVID situation then, uh, but just no evidence about what if anything happened during that period no but i think it's telling that no other units at all were, were let in that period and, and not well, for a lack of trying well that's the problem um, yeah. the lack of trying there's simply no evidence about the trying all we've got is the evidence is that nothing was let now you made the statement of a couple of times i think to the effect that uh, uh, the the owner as a fiduciary duty to maximize profits, but you also say, in effect, well, the owner has thousands of units all over the place. It's not involved with the letting of these individual units. That's down to the, I call it the agent. Um, and we don't know what, if anything, the agent did. Uh, it's simply silence, isn't it? All we know is that they didn't didn't let any units um, between October of 19 and December of 21. Mm -hmm. We've got from your schedule that they didn't let any units, but we know nothing about whether they tried to, and if they did, what they did to try mm -hmm. to. It's yeah. radio silence. Correct. Uh, I, I, I note that. Um, you know, one of the points raised by my learned friend was the absence of Elaine Dabar's evidence. Another issue we face in Dubai is it's a transient expat community. Um, Elaine, I understand, is back in Dubai, but had left Dubai uh, after these shortly after these proceedings had commenced. So, um, yeah, look, that's a situation we face in, in all realms of matters that. Uh, tracking down witnesses who have left the country and the continent um, is, is something that's quite difficult uh, at times. So Ross uh, McLaughlin has come in and had access to all of these emails. And these emails have painted a very clear picture that this lease was terminated as a consequence of the defendant's default. And that's not disputed. You know, the defendant's efforts in terms of fitting out those premises was woeful. And the point now being made is that there is a counterclaim. Um, I'm at a loss at how any counterclaim could come in circumstances where when given the property that she signed a new lease for, she has 
the premises, she's already received three quarters of a million dirhams towards the cost of the fit out and has the permits to proceed, has the property in her possession, has a period of seven months to complete works that her own contractor said would be finished in five. And we are left with the scenario that we got. The, the context of the counterclaim, the first part, which yesterday in her, or the day before in her email, in her witness statement, she now purportedly drops. But the second part, claiming damages uh, for the defendant, for the claimant's failure to comply with the lease, war warrants a complete strikeout. I mean, that just has absolutely no merits at all. And that is something that, that I would submit must be done today. And and would note that on the rest of the, uh, uh, the the rest of the case, there is a question on mitigation, but nothing else. There is no question on the termination. Perhaps the date, but the date, if, if it is shown that we mitigated from the date that it was terminated, be it November, December, or January, the mitigation efforts as all the all that needs to be proven, everything else is either conceded or irrefutable. If I was to find that there is a question about the date of termination and a question about call it mitigation, whether reasonable steps were taken to find an alternate tenant, if I find there were questions, or in Mr. Lee's terms, triable issues, although really we have to look at real prospect of success, but apply I agree those with that. If we apply those that formula to the questions of date of termination and mitigation, but uh, find that uh, it's established that there was termination uh, and it's established that uh, the counterclaim cannot succeed, what, what orders should follow from all of that? I would, uh, I appreciate that position and the question. My proposition would be that we resume this in immediate judgment application on those two questions alone and not subject these parties to a trial because this matter has gone on too long and and the, and taking this further to a trial uh, on that point of mitigation, um, on that very limited point, I, I think would be um, uh, not worth it. Can, can or should the court um in effect allow the matter to proceed to trial only on those issues or is it the case that the court either grants immediate judgment or it doesn't no so my uh, understanding and i will just uh find the reference yeah. to the relevant provision of part 24 mm -hmm. um but the court does have the opportunity here to um determine the case as a whole or part as, yes. as determined. And um, from what occurs there, um, I, I don't, I, I think if the parties are afforded an opportunity to, to be able to present on these limited issues, then that would be the, the best way to proceed uh, just in a continuation of this application. Um, You mean in effect to adjourn the application, come back, have another go at it? Only, uh, and, and this occurred, this um, happened in a case recently, immediate judgment application, the defendant was given a second opportunity to file his evidence and we came back and, and continued it from that point. But, um, and I just followed the precedent that, that was that I experienced in that case. To what I think you were adverting to uh, a minute or two ago was uh, Rule 24.11, which provides the orders of the court may make on the application on an application under Part 24 include one judgment on the claim or any part of the claim, mm -hmm. two the striking out or dismissal of the claim three dismissal of the application for a conditional order now as far as judgment on any part of the claim is concerned 
Well, no, I'll go to the second one first. The okay. striking out or dismissal of the claim, well, that could apply equally to the counterclaim. So, Correct. for example, I could, uh, an order open to the court would be to dismiss the counterclaim. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in relation to the claim itself, I don't know that it's amenable to giving judgment on any part of the claim because the uh, this is not a case where uh, there, there are, in a sense, claims for uh, different causes of action or for Correct. different discrete damages or anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. Rather, the, the questions of the date of termination and the mitigation all go to the question of of what if any damages um well two questions the first question um what arrears of rent are due mm -hmm. because until mm -hmm. one knows the date of termination you can't determine the amount of the rent mm -hmm. and then secondly the uh question of i call it loss of bargain damages because mm -hmm. to do that you've got to know one the date of termination and two uh where there's a live sorry real prospect of success on the mitigation plea yeah so if i go back to uh in a sense the permutations that i think you put forward a few minutes ago that could lead to a dismissal of the counterclaim but i don't think it could lead to the grant of any part of the claim um, nor, I think, is it a case where I could, as it were, uh, give a judgment that it's been established that there was a lease, it's been established that the um, defendant breached it, it's been established that it was terminated. Uh, I say I don't think there's any real issue about any of those points. From I don't think the defendant has really raise them, but I, I don't think that's amenable to any form of order or judgment. Um, the, well, that's it, I think. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's, um, yeah. uh, I, I'm more, not more than happy, but uh, I'm, um, I believe we achieved something today. <laughs> if, right, the, yes. if the counterclaim is struck out, and we can focus the the final stage of this matter just trying to work out what the whether what the mitigation was in terms of the the date of the termination uh, i think we are talking about a matter of weeks whether it's october november quite i mean at the absolute out outside december because it's it's her it's the letter yeah. in december that she responds to where she said that reaffirmed her understanding but it seems that the the conduct that occurred in november was everyone now treated this as over once she served that letter from her lawyers um it was that it, it was then everyone walked away um and thought this is over um yes so we are in the and i believe between myself and mr lee we could agree that date um uh, uh, to the point that it doesn't need to be debated at the trial uh, or at the next right. stage and and then we just focus um on mitigation all right yeah. all right is there any further anything else you want to add mr bull uh no your honor um all right now i'm just going to go back to mr lee uh, you of course don't have a right of rejoinder but I'm conscious that Mr. Bull raised some matters in the in his reply in relation to uh, granting part of the claim or striking out uh, the counterclaim, which were not addressed previously, although I think it's implicit in the submissions you've made. But I, I just give you an opportunity if you wish to take it to make any submissions about those matters Mr. Bull raised? Uh, much obliged, <clears throat> Your Honour. Um, and start from the uh, rule that Your Honour identified, which is 24.11. Hmm. It is certainly not uh, open to this court to give 
partial image judgments on the uh, any part of the plane. Uh, and I think that's where the order is going to. And the defendant, Ms. Curry, is entitled to raise tribal defenses. And I think that your honor uh, is uh, with me on this point. So the various points of inflection that I have raised, uh, I'm grateful that uh, if I understand your honor correctly, uh, we'll be able to raise them uh, at trial. Well, when I haven't comes... made a decision yet, Mr. Lee, but I'm, I'm just uh, raising Understood. these matters with what I might decide. As it pleases your honor, yes. Uh, I will then say that on a qualified basis, hmm. uh, yes. Where it comes to the counterclaim, your honor, here's where it gets, I'll raise a few factors, again, in intellectual honesty. The first is that uh, if the counterclaim is lower uh, than uh, Emirates rates primary claim, it is equally open to us to raise it as a set of defense rather than as a uh, as a counterclaim. And the thing is that, of course, that is just a conceptual notion, uh, which I'm uh, putting out for the purposes of completeness. I think that my overriding duty here is to assist the court in figuring out what's the best way, the most expeditious way, and the fairest way for all parties to resolve the dispute. I'm now in a situation where, without the benefit of analysis on concurrent delay and quantum, I'm unable to see whether you know I can, as I had advised Ms. Kakari to do, to drop part of the counterclaim pertaining to malicious prosecution, because that was a matter of pure law, and I could well yes. do that. Where it comes to me, if I may be in breach of my duty of care to my client if I were to say, yes, let us drop the counterclaim. I think that one halfway house, Your Honour, which I raise for your con your Honour's consideration, and just because I want to balance my duty to the client and my duty to the court well, is whether Your Honour might be inclined to exercise your power, Your Honour's powers to act, appoint an expert, a delay in quantum expert, to give a preliminary analysis as to the merits and your, we can give, both Mr. Bu and I can give inputs, Your Honour has a final say in the language of the instructions. And if the expert says no viable case, we drop it. But if the expert were to say, well, it is triable, then I think it is only fair that we be allowed to raise that, either in the form of a counterclaim or a set of defence. Yes. All right. Well, yes. thank you, Mr. Oh. Lee. Now, again, I don't want to turn this into a ping pong game, but Mr. Bull, I think you should have the final reply. Thank you, Your Honour. Um, I strongly oppose any uh, proposition to uh, engage experts. Um, another cost for both parties to incur. Um, there is, in terms of the concurrency, I don't follow the argument. Um, as I think we put forward clearly in our skeleton arguments, uh, from the 1st of January, and beforehand even, when she took possession of the premises till August, when she was due to have completed her fit out, the, the claimant did nothing to it to obstruct. She had the permits, she had the money paid to her, she had the premises. Uh, I can't see any um, issue of uh, concurrent delay or, or contribution to the delay. The, it is noted and agreed uh, in Ms. Kikari's evidence that in May, the works to the mall were finished, um, which, of course, if she had finished her works um, by May, she, they would have been ready to go on opening. Once the mall uh, works were finished, the works became more difficult because you, you had uh, occupants in the mall, so the, the noisy works and things would have to be only done at night. So there was no concurrent delay. I mean, that's just not a, that is just not something that, that needs to be investigated or looked at at all. Of course, the claimant can bring uh, the defendant can bring a, a counterclaim again if it wants to try, but the one that's been put forward needs to be struck out. That that is my position today. And um, I, I think you know, I trust that the the next proceeding will be before yourself, Your Honour, and. In that case, we uh, can essentially proceed from the basis that we are here now. Um, 
and had the opportunity to uh, present new evidence on mitigation and focus that proceeding on, on the mitigation issue. All right, well, thank you very much, Mr. Bull. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lee and your assistant. Uh, I, and uh, I thank the court officers for your patience. Um, I will reserve my decision. Uh, and of course, in the usual way, you'll be notified when it is ready. So thank you. And that concludes today's hearing. Thank you, Your Honour.